These are thoracic radiology board review cases. The topic of this group is alveolar diseases. What's your differential diagnosis? There are heterogeneous opacities in this patient's lungs in a multifocal bilateral distribution. Two imaging patterns are present, an interlobular septal pattern that predominates, and also some ground glass opacities. Since the interlobular septal pattern is the more dominant of the two, it's a good place to start from for constructing our differential diagnosis. This is our differential diagnosis for an interlobular septal pattern. As it turns out, ground glass opacities can be present with any of these four disorders, so the ground glass opacities don't help that much in pruning our differential diagnosis down. One comment about the first item on this list, pulmonary edema. Remember, pulmonary edema can be cardiogenic or non-cardiogenic. Examples of non-cardiogenic edema that can look like this include most of the situations that can cause capillary leak pulmonary edema. So I'd keep things like acute lung injury, trolley, and drug-induced lung injury in mind in addition to, say, CHF. This particular case is an example of pulmonary alveolar proteinosis, or PAP. With PAP, surfactant buildup causes increased flow in the pulmonary lymphatics and edema in the interlobular septi, which can sometimes cause cough, progressive dyspnea, and respiratory insufficiency. What proportion of alveolar proteinosis cases are idiopathic? Idiopathic or primary PAP is the most common form of PAP and accounts for at least 90% of PAP cases. Idiopathic or primary PAP is believed to be an autoimmune disease where autoantibodies against granulocyte macrophage colony stimulating factor prevent the clearing of pulmonary surfactant by alveolar macrophages. Name two non-idiopathic causes of PAP. Non-idiopathic or secondary PAP can occur in association with hematological malignancies, inhalational exposure to some occupational dusts, and also in the setting of immunosuppression after solid organ transplantation or allogenic BMT. What's your differential diagnosis? The findings in this case are multiple bilateral, predominantly peripheral regions of peribronchovascular consolidation and ground glass pasties. At least one focus in the lateral mid left lung has a reverse halo appearance. Since anything that causes consolidation can also cause ground glass pasties, the differential diagnosis for this case will be. Um, primarily derived from our differential diagnosis for non-diffuse acute consolidation and chronic consolidation. Although reverse halo sign is classically associated with organizing pneumonia, it actually is not a terribly specific sign as everything on this list with the exception of pulmonary lymphoma could manifest with a reverse halo sign, which means that we are left with this differential diagnosis. This case um, ended up being an example of chronic eosinophilic pneumonia. Chronic eosinophilic pneumonia is an uncommon inflammatory, non-infectious lung condition where lung parenchyma is infiltrated by predominantly eosinophils. A multifocal bilateral peripheral pattern of heterogeneous lung opacities is a classic presentation of CEP, which some radiologists um, have described as the, quote, photographic negative, unquote, of pulmonary edema. Half of patients with chronic eosinophilic pneumonia have asthma, and increased eosinophils are often present in their peripheral blood. Symptoms can include shortness of breath, fever, cough, weight loss, and malaise, but this disorder can also respond relatively rapidly to steroid therapy. What diagnosis do you favor in this case?
The simultaneous presence of diffuse centrilobular nodular interstitial pattern, diffuse ground glass opacities, and a mosaic attenuation pattern are strongly suggestive for a diagnosis of non-fibrotic hypersensitivity pneumonitis. All of the following are imaging findings of non-fibrotic HP, except the answer here is E, all of the above. Any of the four imaging findings listed here, um, ground glass opacities, consolidation, centrilobular ground glass opacities, and air trapping can be encountered in the setting of non-fibrotic HP. What's your differential diagnosis for this case? The imaging features of this case are very similar to the first case we saw just a couple of minutes ago. We have an extensive multifocal bilateral heterogeneous uh, lung opacity pattern with both an interlobular septal pattern and ground glass opacities. In the first case we showed, the septal pattern predominated over the ground glass pattern, while in this case, the two patterns exist in relatively equal amounts. However, as ground glass opacities um, can occur um, in any um, disorder in our differential diagnosis list for interlobular septal pattern, our differential diagnosis um, ends up being derived from the causes of an interlobular septal pattern, as you see here. As with our first case, this case is also an example of pulmonary alveolar protonosis. What's your differential diagnosis for this case? The finding in this case are multiple bilateral, predominantly peripheral lung opacities. These opacities can be described as mostly ground glass opacities in character, but with some peribronchovascular consolidation and also subtle interstitial features too. Ground glass passes are very nonspecific when they don't exist in isolation, so the most specific differential diagnosis in this case will be based off of the consolidation. This consolidation is non-diffuse in its distribution and may represent either an acute or chronic presentation, which results in this differential diagnosis, which is a union of the differential diagnoses for non-diffuse acute consolidation and chronic consolidation. As we mentioned before, the presence of ground glass passes is not terribly specific and can occur in the setting of everything on this list except for pulmonary lymphoma, which means that the differential diagnosis in this case would be this. This particular um, case ended up being an example of chronic eosinophilic pneumonia. Which of the following statements about CEP is true? It turns out that all four of these statements about chronic eosinophilic pneumonia are true. Folks believe it may represent a form of hypersensitivity pneumonitis. It generally occurs in young and middle-aged adults. Most patients have peripheral eosinophilia, and the presence of the lung opacities, as in this case, is usually multifocal. Which of the following statements about acute eosinophilic pneumonia is true? In this case, all four statements about acute eosinophilic pneumonia are true. It's an unusual lung injury response pattern. Unlike chronic eosinophilic pneumonia, however, it occurs in patients of all ages. Half of patients, rather than most patients, have peripheral eosinophilia, and the presentation is usually diffuse rather than multifocal on imaging. What's your differential diagnosis? The lung opacity pattern in this patient is a diffuse consolidation pattern. Differential diagnosis for diffuse consolidation is cardiogenic pulmonary edema, non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, including ARDS, DAD, um, or other causes, um, diffuse alveolar hemorrhage, and diffuse infection. There are a few imaging features that permit us to differentiate, to, to, uh, differentiate between these individual causes on this list. And if we hope to be more specific, we need to either rely on statistics or knowledge of the patient's clinical setting and presentation. 
With regards to lung infections, the number of infections that can present as a diffuse cons bilateral consolidation pattern is actually relatively limited and can be divided into three buckets. Bucket one are immunosuppressed patients, and we would think about PJP and HSV pneumonia. Bucket two are folks who are at aspiration risk, and we would think about massive aspiration pneumonia. Finally, bucket three are viral epidemics or pandemics, with good examples being influenza, SARS, and MERS. Not all viral epidemics um, present diffusely, however, on imaging. Um, COVID, for example, uh, tends to present in a more multifocal bilateral peripheral lower lung distribution than a diffuse distribution. This particular case is a classic example of cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Classic features of cardiogenic pulmonary edema are diffuse bilateral um, consolidation with peripheral sparing, as in this case, uh, resulting in what some folks describe as a butterfly or bat wing appearance. However, cardiogenic pulmonary edema does not always present in a symmetric bilateral pattern. Cardiogenic pulmonary edema can appear unilateral sometimes, um, such as in patients who may preferentially lie in a decubitus position or who have underlying emphysema that's very asymmetric. Cardiogenic pulmonary edema can also appear at multifocal or even focal and closely mimic the look we'd instinctively want to call pneumonia. This range of potential appearances makes cardiogenic pulmonary edema challenging to distinguish from pneumonia on chest radiographs. Um, though uh, knowledge of how the consolidation changes from x-ray to x-ray can sometimes help a little. While the areas of consolidation in cardiogenic pulmonary edema may wax and wane across successive chest x-rays, the areas of consolidation in pneumonia tend to be more fixed over time. What is your best diagnosis in this case? In this case, the alveolar disease is one of decreased lung attenuation rather than increased lung attenuation. We see regions of decreased lung attenuation due to emphysema that are most pronounced in both lower lungs, which makes the best diagnosis in this case panlobular emphysema, which we also um, may refer to as panaster emphysema. What disorders are associated with panlobular emphysema? The answer to this question is E, all of the above, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, Swire-James, and IV Ritalin abuse. Next question. Which of the following statements about alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency is true? The true statement amongst the four options here is D, progression of penaster emphysema due to alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency is most pronounced during the third and fifth decades of life, meaning people in their 20s through 40s. The first statement here is false. Smoking is synergistic and can greatly accelerate the rate of panlobular emphysema progression in alpha-1 antitrypsin deficient patients. The second statement is false. Liver disease can develop in up to 10% of infants who are alpha-1 antitrypsin deficient. Finally, the third statement is also false. Patients with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency are at increased risk of developing a number of malignancies, including HCC, gallbladder cancer, urinary bladder cancer, lung cancer, and lymphoma. Which of these statements about the management of alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency is true? The true statement is B, ivory replacement of alpha-1 antitrypsin slows the rate of lung parenchyma loss. Statement A is false. No controlled studies have shown a survival benefit from ivory replacement of alpha-1 antitrypsin. Statement C is also false. Although gene therapy is arguably promising, work is still in the early stages. Statement D is also false. Albuterol and inhaled steroids can help patients with their symptoms. A few notes about the pathophysiology of um, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Uh, neutrophils normally release an enzyme called elastase to disrupt 
connective tissues in the lungs in order to migrate through the lung parenchyma. Excess elastase activity is typically mitigated by alpha-1 antitrypsin, 90% of which is produced in the liver. In alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, elastase activity is unchecked, which can cause lung parenchymal damage. In addition, excess elastase stimulates macrophages to release chemotractants, recruiting an increased number of neutrophils to the lung. As you can see, the distribution of emphysema in alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency is different than for smoking-related emphysema, which exhibits an upper lung predominant pattern. And two final points, um, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency is an autosomal dominant disorder, and it predominantly affects patients of Caucasian European descent. How would you best characterize the distribution of alveolar opacities in this patient? The best answer is D, centrilobular. The opacities in this patient generally spare the regions immediately adjacent to the pulmonary vessels, which would be a hallmark of a peribronchovascular pattern had they been present. Um, the opacities show a repetitive pattern, unlike the unpredictable and haphazard distribution pattern we would expect of a random uh, presentation. The opacities also spare the lung margins along the rib cage and fissures, which would have been a hallmark of a perilymphatic pattern. Based on our knowledge of the size and distribution of the secondary pulmonary lobules, you can probably imagine how each of these opacities on this image is centered upon a secondary pulmonary lobule. What's your best diagnosis for this case? This pattern of a markedly um, central lobular distribution of airspace passes with inner uh, portions that approach the same attenuation as bone or calcium is a classic case of metastatic calcification, which is a condition where calcium deposition occurs within normal lung parenchyma. Which of the four tests here is most specific for metastatic calcification? The answer we're looking for is choice C, a technetium-99 bone scan. Our next question is a point counterpoint. What are the CT imaging features of pulmonary alveolar microlithiasis, or PAM? Unlike metastatic calcification, which is calcium deposition in normal lung parenchyma, PAM is a, another rare disorder, but one where calcium deposition occurs in damaged lung parenchyma. Imaging features of PAM are very fine calcifications along the interlobular septi, ground glass passes with interlobular septal thickening, and subpleural cysts. In patients with PAM, the calcifications can sometimes become confluent in severe areas. What's your best diagnosis in this case? The finding in this case can be described as either a mass or a focal region of consolidation with irregular and speculated margins. However, what's unusual about this opacity is that it's internally heterogeneous with regions of fat attenuation. This is pathic pneumonic for chronic exogenous lipoid pneumonia. Three of the following statements about chronic exogenous lipoid pneumonia are true, and one is false. Which is the false statement? The false statement is B. Chronic and exogenous lipoid pneumonia, a foreign body reaction, can exhibit increased FDG uptake on PET. The other three statements are true statements. Yes, fat may be absent in some chronic exogenous lipoid pneumonia opacities. With their size and speculated margins, they can appear indistinguishable from lung cancer when there's no macroscopic fat present. Yes, the opacities tend to be irreversible and appear unchanged even when the source of the exogenous uh, lipid has been eliminated. And finally, yes, cavitation can sometimes occur. 
Cases of chronic exogenous lipoid pneumonia are often attributed to the aspiration of mineral oil or some other lipid-containing fluid into the peripheral lung. Most cases are, however, asymptomatic and picked up on imaging incidentally. Next question. How does endogenous lipoid pneumonia differ from exogenous lipoid pneumonia? Endogenous lipoid pneumonia occurs when damaged lung tissue releases fat and cholesterol in the setting of a more central bronchial occlusion, which can result in an obstructive pneumonitis with lipid accumulation. In CT imaging of endogenous lipoid pneumonia, macroscopic fat is not typically encountered. What is your differential diagnosis for this case? The imaging finding here is a region, um, are regions of peribronchovascular consolidation through which air bronchograms course. There's a subtle amount of local retraction and architectural distortion as demonstrated by the kind of um, the beating almost appearance of the um, air bronchograms, which suggest a chronic rather than acute time course. The differential diagnosis for chronic consolidation contains a number of items. Though the most common ones um, would be probably chronic lung infection, organizing pneumonia, and GPA on this list. This case is an example of organizing pneumonia. Organizing pneumonia is a lung injury response pattern. So what are the most common insults that result in OP in the lung? The three most common causes of organizing pneumonia are lung injury occurring in the setting of lung infection, drug-induced lung injury, and also collagen vascular disease. Constrictive bronchiolitis, uh, what we used to refer to as bronchiolitis obliterans, is another lung injury pattern. What are the most common insults that cause constrictive bronchiolitis? The most common insults we're looking for are lung injury occurring in the setting of viral bronchiolitis, drug-induced lung injury, and collagen vascular disease, in addition to chronic lung transplant rejection and toxic inhalation. Which of the following statements about cryptogenic organizing pneumonia are true? The answer is B. Most cases of cryptogenic organizing pneumonia present in middle-aged folks in their 40s through 60s. The other statements about COP are false since COP presents equally with regards to gender and patients usually present with a short history, usually a one to two months history of symptoms like breathlessness, non-productive cough, weight loss, malaise, and fever. There is also no association between COP and smoking. What's your differential diagnosis for this case? In this case, we're presented with a focal lung opacity that consists of ground glass passes and a few bands of consolidation. Ground glass passes that don't appear in isolation are nonspecific, so our differential diagnosis um, is probably better based off the bands of consolidation, for which our differential diagnosis is, as on a few prior cases, this list. Since ground loss passes are present, uh, one of the f seven items on this list is excluded. This particular case is an example of chronic eosinophilic pneumonia. With CEP, what's the standard treatment and how soon is improvement usually observed? Standard therapy for chronic eosinophilic pneumonia is long-term oral corticosteroids, and usually some improvement can be observed within one to two weeks after the initiation of treatment. What's your differential diagnosis for this case? The findings here um, are a diffuse bilateral consolidative pattern. The opacities appear slightly coarse, as there seems to be a subtle interstitial um, opacities coexisting with the dominant consolidation pattern. The differential diagnosis for diffuse consolidation is as follows here. Uh, this case is an example of ARDS diffuse alveolar damage. 
Diffuse alveolar damage is one cause of non-cardiogenic edema. Can you name three more? Causes of non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, we should remember, include ARDS, diffuse alveolar damage, drug-induced lung injury, toxic inhalation, transfusion-related acute lung injury, and strange rangers, such as near-drowning, neurogenic pulmonary edema, and high-altitude pulmonary edema. There are many other causes of non-cardiogenic edema besides just the ones here on this um, slide, and this list uh, should not be considered exhaustive. If this were a CT pattern, uh, if this were a CT of a patient who's recently post-allergenic BMT, what's the most likely diagnosis? We have extensive bilateral consolidation in this patient. The consolidation looks, for lack of a better word, fluffy, suggesting that its time course is most likely acute rather than chronic. Chronic consolidation tends to exist, uh, exhibit focal architectural distortion and scarring of the underlying lung parenchyma, as you'd expect um, once a chronic inflammatory process and its associated collateral damage have been at play in the lung for a while. Regardless of whether we label this as a multifocal consolidation pattern or diffuse consolidation pattern, I think we'd all agree that lung infection, probably opportunistic, and alveolar hemorrhage would be in our differential diagnosis in a patient recently post allo BMT with this kind of CT imaging. Um, this particular patient um, ended up having a diagnosis of, alve of uh, alveolar hemorrhage in the setting of graft versus host disease. Can you name at least three causes of alveolar hemorrhage? Hopefully, you might be able to name more than just three causes, and this table I copied from one of our first-year resident um, talks provides a nice recap of the causes of alveolar hemorrhage as categorized by patient presentation.